Hey everyone, you're listening to Nerd Boys Comic Blog. I'm Marco. I'm Damon. And today we're talking about comics for the first time in probably a month. Yeah. Um, yeah. We, we, we picked up DC Nation Zero. And Avengers number one. Um, I just want to say, um, rest in peace, Roger. I hope Mary's okay. I hope she recovers from this loss. Um, it's really important to me that people know that Roger didn't deserve this. He was a good man. And yeah. Yeah, Roger being the guy who the Joker uh, in DC Nation number zero. There's three different stories. You have a Tom King story, a Bendis story, and then Scott Snyder. Yeah. Out of the three, which one do you think is the the best, and which one do you think is the worst? I think the best is probably the Joker story, just because it's it's also kind of exists. The other ones are previews, and there's not a lot of context. But the Joker story exists to be in this book. It feels like, and it's yeah. like. It begins and end, begin, middle and end in a way that's like, okay, I get what's going on. It just kind of gets you excited for the wedding of Bat, um, Bat, Batman and, and Cat Catwoman Woman or Batwoman and Catman. Um, I really think it's weird that female Batman from Negative Universe was named Bryce Wayne. What the heck is I've never heard of a girl named Bryce before. That, you never heard of Bryce Dallas Howard? From uh, Spider-Man 3 and um, Jurassic World. I should have completely didn't even think about That's that. Ron Howard's daughter? Yeah. Oh, okay. He put half of those genes together. I know it's surprising, right? Yeah. If you look at if you look at all Happy Days, it makes sense. You're like, oh, yeah, Ron Howard used to be pretty good looking man. <laughs> yeah. Now he's old. Well, he's good looking for an old guy. The point is, the SJWs. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so uh, what, what was your favorite story in... The DC Nation. My shot. favorite? I think the best story was Bendis. No, wait. Flip that around. Worst was Bendis. Best was King. King really had like a self contained story. Yeah. The Joker was full of bad puns and like. Oh man, no, I loved every single pun. Every yeah. joke that he did. What was my favorite? My favorite was probably, um, I can tell you the truth. I don't know the whole alphabet. Do you know why? <laughs> <laughs> I like. That one was the best. Oh. And then there's all the uh, I can't remember all of them. It's like, did you hear the one about the uh, the letter without a stamp? Ah, uh, you probably wouldn't get it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and just the tension between the Joker and Roger because the Joker's only broken into this guy's house because he wants Batman's wedding invitation. Yeah, I don't even know how he knows Batman's getting married, but he's like, I- I'm just gonna wait here, and and it'll happen. It'll come. It'll go. Yeah. And eventually they do get something in the mail, but the Joker in his craziness, he's like. I'm invited. <laughs> it kills Roger anyways. Oh, man. Yeah. I was, like, bummed out about that. I was uh, I was kind of hoping, like, oh, don't worry. Because he has a, the bang gun with, like, yeah. a little flag. I was hoping, like, that would be the ending. But then it happened in the middle. I was like, oh, no. <laughs> it's not going to be a bang gun. Yeah, no. Um, what did you hate about the Binda story? Uh, well, why do you think it was the worst? The uncertainty of whether or not Lois and Jonathan are still in this universe but that's funny I think it's funny because I think that that's what the that's what the point is to, for you to be like oh my god what's gonna happen like um cause I don't think they're gone I don't think they're gone I think um people really like those characters I was just talking to Cordy the other day I got her into Super Sons and what well, do I didn't get her into Super Sons somebody else did they gave her the, the Superman Tomasi um Tomasi and Gleason Superman which book. is my favorite yeah and she's just like, oh my god, I love John. And I was just like, you gotta read Super Sons then, because it's just John and um, and Damian Wayne. And she's like, yes. <laughs> um, so I'd be really surprised if they got rid of those characters, because they're really fun characters, they're really good characters, and, and also, like, that run is so good. I don't see why anybody would go back and be like, oh, let's let's wipe the slate clean. But I think... I think for some reason, Business thinks it's, it's a good idea for, like, the beginning of his run of Superman to be... Jess um, Clark. I think one of the problems he's kind of giving him right now is that, like, they're gone. And I think they're gone for some reason. Like, they've been taken by, like, a bad guy or something. He has to, like, deal with the fact they're not around. Because he seemed sad. He didn't seem angry or upset. He seemed, like, sad. And they just kind of said that Lois was gone, which kind of suggests that, like, she's gone in a very, like, she could be gone due to some mysterious circumstances that he wouldn't be able to explain it to anybody. But telling other people that, like, oh, this person, she went off to go work on her novel or whatever, so they can't tell people on the regular, ba- tell people, like, oh, she's gone, like, she's gonna, she's gonna, you're gonna see her around, but she's not working here anymore. And 
I don't think they would break up Lois and Superman. I think that's just like a really dumb idea. Yeah, because they they just got back together in 2016. Yeah, and like to break them up two years later, it's it's a little bit like what? Yeah, it's also one of the best couples in comics. Oh yeah, no, they just because they they're made for each other and they work and. I think they gotta stay strong, and, it, it, and and when they work, they work. I just think it's such a cool idea to have them like be stable in that way, and like have the, a husband and wife team. Because even Billings was talking about this. That was his goal with like Jessica Jones and um, Luke Cage was like to make them like always stable, no matter what else is going on around them in the superhero world. Like they're together. Like that's their the they the OTP like and I think that like for DC that's definitely Lois and Clark I mean they had a whole TV show it was one of my favorites yeah and then to the final story which was uh No Justice or Prelude to No Justice yeah was it pre- I felt like it it felt like it was taken out of the first issue of No Justice it specifically says like Prelude to No Justice something like that yeah, yeah. so like it, it, it was like a I, I don't know I'm, I'm curious it made me really curious like what what makes the teams together it seems like the reason why you have these this particular group of villains helping out the Justice League is like because they realize that the threats to the universe and their world is much more important than their own personal like vendettas yeah um, the Justice League members seem to be the ones that's the most like what are we doing this is a bad idea. The villains seem like totally fine, but the leaguers are definitely like, well, uh, this no, this makes no sense. Why are we teaming up with Lex Luthor? What I'm confused about is like, why is Lex did Lex Luthor turn evil again, or is he still like anti-hero Lex? Uh, from what I saw in the DC, the other story, the Superman one was Lex armor on all these bad guys. Yeah, but that so was, that could be stolen. But that was stolen. Though. Yeah, it said that it was like old Lex Corp stuff. It was stolen. So yeah, I think. Towards the end of the Gleason run, they were hinting or showing that, like, Lex is eventually just going to go back to bad. Yeah. And I, I'm pretty sure Bendis is like, when I was reading comics, Lex was a bad guy, so I'll just do that. Because I think a lot of Bendis stuff, he's like, he knows Superman from, like, 90s to, like, 2000, and that's it. And that's why he even references, he references uh, President Luther. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm, I'm pretty sure he's, like, going to be very familiar with 80s and 90s Superman. Well, I mean, Lex, is, Lex always eventually goes back to be a villain. I just was wondering how long... Because especially with the... It's weird to me that, like, Lex has been an anti-hero for, like, the last couple of years. And for them to be, like... Everybody to be, like, oh, I don't trust Lex Luthor is kind of a little bit weird to me. But at yeah. the same time, it's probably... He was literally on the Justice League, like, 20, 2013 to, like, 2016. Yeah, yeah. So, like... It's kind of funny for them to be like, oh, we have villains on this team. And I also like the fact that Lex just looks like he's just really happy to show up Batman whenever he gets the chance. Like, that's just, like, his whole real purpose for being there. Yeah. It's like, oh, I saved your life. <laughs> I'm really excited to see what Snyder does with all these different teams. Because yeah. it does, at glance, at first glance, look really random. Like, why Starfire with, like... Who is it? Um, I need to look up Superman. the teams real quick. Superman. It's like Superman, Starfire. Starro. Uh, Starro. A bunch of the aliens. And then yeah. for like another team, it's Wonder Woman and Magic Users. And then like for one team, it's like Batman and all the anti-heroes and Beast Boy. Yeah. And Beast Boy. Like, it's... There are two teams that seem to make perfect sense to me and the two teams that don't. Like, Team um, Wonder and Team Mystery make the most sense because like, Mystery is like all the alien characters for the most part. And then Wonder is all the magic characters for the most part. Yeah. But then you have like Team Wisdom. Team Wisdom, which is like Flash, Harley Quinn, the Adam. Cyborg, the Atom. And I'm like, oh, what? <laughs> like, it's kind of like doctors. A, yeah, have I guess it's a lot degrees. of yeah, um, yeah. Harley Quinn's a doctor. Except Cyborg. Cyborg's not a doctor, but then he's a his, robot. His dad was a doctor. Yeah, and, and he's a robot who's happened yeah. to the internet and is pretty smart. He's pretty smart before that. And then there's, like, Entropy, which is just, like, you were, like, I like the, um, the bad boys of DC, <laughs> pretty much, <laughs> I guess. Um, you know, you got you got Lex Luthor. You got um, Lobo, Beast, Beast Boy, who I guess is a bad boy. I mean, he got people catching villains, so maybe... <laughs> I was just trying to find a way to put that in there. Yeah. Like, it was it was natural. It wasn't natural, but hey, that song is awesome. I kind of found something interesting. Both these teams are pretty much assembled. I, I, I'm going to use that word. Yeah. Both these teams are assembled, both uh, the new Justice League and the new Avengers, 
are assembled because there's a giant space alien coming to destroy yeah. Earth. Giant space aliens coming. This is a both. This yeah. Is, this is a common theme. Behind the source wall, apparently, there's these four giant uh, kind of celestial looking things. And in Avengers number one, there are hundreds of falling celestials dying. And you have a bunch of giant ones at the end of the book. Yeah, they're like evil. They're like evil celestials, particularly like they they on this planet called Cole and Justice League. And I think they call it the Titans. There's some. Yeah, they're they're like the Titans, but not the Teen Titans. Yeah, I can't. What, yeah. what was the? Uh, That's Brainiac's homeworld right there. Cole yeah. Cole Cole Yeah. What do they call them? We I'm looking for it. The words they used were something. Also, like this thread of like. They can all read each other's feelings really well, which was something that kind of came through. Oh, yeah, that was a, a major thing. Like, Batman has no feelings. Superman wears his feelings on his sleeve. Yeah, they, they, they all fight in giant, um, world-sized, basically, um, celestial things, which I think it's strange, a, a really strange parallel for both of the main teams of the prospective companies going into... Going into the new lineup changes. Um, what did you think of Avengers number one? Um, Jason Aaron, Ed McGinnis, Mark Morales, David Curl on Light as Colors, I think. Well, I thought it was it was alright. I mean, I'm not going to be like, oh, I hate this new Avengers lineup because it has people I don't like. No, I like all these characters. Uh, I especially loved the part in the bar with the Trinity. Yeah. With uh, Cap, Tony Stark, and Thor. They are just like, Wow. Things have been really weird for the past two years at Marvel. Yeah. I was in a coma. Cap was Hydra. Thor had no she- uh Thor was unworthy. Thor, Thor was yeah. unworthy. He had no hammer. And, man, isn't it great that we're all somewhat back together? Yeah. It's, uh, Iron Man is, like, a kind of against the whole concept of them restarting the Avengers again. And be, Well, really, he's not against the concept of the Avengers. He's against the concept of these three being at the center of the Avengers again. He's like, people... I. You know, there are new people out here, people who can do better stuff than we can. We should just let them do it. And Cap's like, no, like, we need to be as ready as everybody else. And we need to, to be, try to adapt to the times and stuff. I like, um, I also really like the conversations between Doctor Strange and Black Panther. There's a few really, like, weird little funny moments. Um, yeah. My strange sense is tingling. He goes, it's not one of your powers. Like, what are you talking about? <laughs> He's just like, well, let's just get out of here. I'm curious how much Robbie Reyes is going to tie into them because he's still in L.A. And also She-Hulk, who is in a very specific position right now because she, like, full hawks out. I am curious about the the, the Celestials, but I'm part of me feels like I'm, gonna, I'm not going to read this one every week. I'm going to, like, catch it. I'm either going to get it in a trade or, like, catch it or comics explained if they do. If yeah. Rob does it, just because I, I like Comics Explain, he's really good at doing this. And um, just as, like, for me, like, the Avengers books are always kind of a lot. I don't know. I just, the whole story, I kind of feel like I need the whole story at once a lot of times with the Avengers books. And so it's a little bit funny to go through and, like, have one whole thing. I'm also curious how much this story is going to tie into Black Panther having his own planet. Yeah. I'm pretty sure there's almost no communication, so, like, Black Panther is going to appear in this, and it's going to be in the Black Panther book. No, there, in there, you, there are. Like, Marvel, I know Marvel has a whole, they have a whole retreat every year. I know. Where they plan out the they plan out the events, and they plan out what everybody's doing, and there's usually enough communication that it makes some sense, and writers reference those events, and then that's what editors tend to keep up with. The editors are there to be like, oh, well, Black Panther's doing this, or so and is doing this, you can't do this, or, you know, this thing, or that thing, or whatever. Yeah, but it looks like this one's kind of like, it could take place during any time. Because it's like three days right after Marvel Legacy. Even though it's come out practically a whole year after. <laughs> yeah. So it's, it's kind of one of those books that's going to be like, well, this takes place after everyone had their adventure. Kind of. I might. Have, I still have to get Marvel Legacy. I haven't read it. I kind of know what happens because I like flip through it a few times, but I still I didn't end up getting it. I'm and sure so. you can find a million copies at every store because that did not. Well, it sold well, but like they made so many issues and they just shipped yeah. so many out. Al Ewing is doing Immortal Hulk, which looks crazy. I don't know why I got distracted, but I did, and it happened. Also, we got Dead Celestials. Apparently, there's hundreds of them going on. Yeah. Um, yeah, so I'm curious where I'm curious where that stuff is going. Um, I like the whole uh, bring the band back together. I like the 
acknowledgement that everything's been new, like all new and all different for a while. But now oh, we're oh uh, yeah. Now we're getting back to like classics. I'm like, okay, that's cool. It's something we kind of needed after like what three, two years after all this crazy nonsense. Yeah, I mean, first Marvel now was great. I didn't like second Marvel now as much. Depending on the book, really. Yeah. Um, over as like an overall thing, like it was like, all right, fine, but like. I mean, as an overall thing, I didn't like it. Specific books, it, it kind of lended itself better to other books. Because it allowed some books to change and some books to be affected by the fact that people went into a whole other dimension and, and dealing with that. Yeah. Some um, books from Marvel now started out strong, just got bad over a few months. Yeah. These, these got bad, it just kind of like petered out, like, kind of. But, yeah, for both of these, I'm digging the art. And McGinnis is always really good. Um, I was telling Marco he did um, Public Enemies, uh, Batman vs Superman, which is they actually did an animated movie of that, which it looks really it looks really similar to his art. It's kind of funny because it's kind of perfect for animation. It looks like every frame always kind of feels a little bit like a cartoon. Yeah, it's got that kind of like early two thousands look to it. It's, yeah, it's also got kind of that um, here here's a free comic kids kind of art to it yeah like it's it's like the best version of that it's the best version of like comic comic art like if if i can put it in like the art you would think of when you think of comics like it's kind of like that you can see like a curvy influence but also a bit of an anime influence and everybody's like really stylized it's ed mcginnis is always really good if you like comics you like ed mcginnis i'm a huge fan francis monopaul i'm really glad to see him doing justice well doing um the No Justice book? Yeah, the No Justice book. But he didn't do this one. What? what, what is... It's cool, because honestly, it's... Actually, is that uh, Jorge Jimenez? Yeah, Jorge Jimenez is doing these issues, which I don't know why uh, Francis Monopoly... Yeah, but I guess I guess they both working on it, which is cool as hell. I love yeah. Jorge Jimenez and Francis Monopoly, and they like, have very... See, I hate when they choose backups of people... They have two artists on a book, like, because of, like, um... Scheduling. Scheduling and stuff. But then they choose two artists who, like, throw you off. Like, they, like, super different. This is one of the reasons that I got mad at, um... I didn't get mad, but I didn't like about uh, Silk was... I really liked Amy Chu's art. And then, like, they switch over to another artist. And I was like, oh, I don't like this artist as much. And it's like, they like, complete different opposites. You know what I mean? Like... They're, like, completely different. Whereas if you look at Francis Monopaul and Harry Jimenez, they don't look the same, but they both have the same kind of energy and a lot of similar influences. And they feel the same in a way that feels like... That that won't feel jarring or strange to, like, switch between issue to issue or make you go, I don't want to read this as much anymore. Yeah. Um, so there's a lot of energy in the Jorge Jimenez work. And I'm like... Yeah, like, I really love his work on um, Super Sons. Yeah. So I'm really glad to see him on Justice League. And then Clay Man working on the Batman story. He's He does a lot of the best Tom King storylines and, like, issues. Yeah. Because he was in, involved with, um, oh, he also had a thing in Action Comics 1000. Yeah. He was doing the Superman, uh, Tom King one. Yeah, that's right, that's right. They did do the comics. He did do the story together. Yeah. It's it's really it's really good. Um. I like his use of Nan Pano Grid a lot in here, and it's like, um, also there's this nice back and forth between the door, like that sense of waiting for the, the letter to come, and you can always kind of see it. The jokes are great, and the storytelling is really good. Also, like the scene where he he tells the, um, the, did you ever hear the one about the letter with the stamp? The punchline is like, giving away that one of the creepiest Joker faces I've ever seen. <laughs> He really thinks he's funny. Like this, uh, honestly, that was kind of funny. Yeah. I liked it. Uh, but like, but yeah. he thinks he's way funnier than he actually is. But yeah, this is whole. He crazy. He's really good at creating this sense of like feeling distant from the situation. Like you just kind of waiting for like him to figure it out, and it feels like this very montagey like story where you get little moments between these characters but like you know that like this is it's been a few hours and roger's scared out of his yeah. freaking mind we know it feels like it's been hours like yeah th the way the panels are translating it, it feels like so much time is going by for roger and he's in so much anguish yeah. but for all we know it could have been like 10 minutes of the joker just sitting there with him but this guy is going through an eternity of <laughs> like <laughs> suffering and torment and just like the impending doom of joker shooting him in the face 
Yeah, and it's just like, oh man, the angles and storytelling are really cool, and they yeah. just they keep the yeah. It's just it's just a really good it's a really good book. My two favorite parts of the story, like when Roger gets up the courage, to, like steal Joker's gun and like just starts screaming and shooting him, but it's it's just a prop gun. Yeah, and then because the- Joker has Joker has this thing where like his gun will have the prop in it, and then he'll shoot again, and it shoots the yeah. second time, like. I mean, if that guy just kept pulling the trigger, I'm sure his Joker would have been killed by a fake bullet or a fake anything. Or maybe it would have been acid. Who knows? Yeah. You never know with the Joker. You never know. And then the art from uh, Jose Luis Garcia Lopez yeah. is, like, really good. It's really solid art from him. He's, like, 70 years old, maybe older than that, and he still turns out really good Superman art. Oh, and, man. Uh, Bendis actually got him out of retirement just for this story. Like, just for this um, little one-shot. Oh, man. That's the dream. I want to work until I'm 70. <laughs> yeah. It was funny, because DC's like, do you want? Do you have any requests for any artists you want to work with? And he was like, uh, can we can we get this guy? Can we, like, ring him up at his house? Yeah. And then he's like, I know he's old, and he wants to watch TV and Netflix all day, because I want to do that right now. <laughs> but I got to work instead. Well, I mean, drawing comics is kind of weird. I was, um, there was a, what's the name? Uh. I can't remember the artist. He did he did the comic that that old, old Rich, Roy Lichtenstein piece is based off of the like one with the um, plane and stuff. And they were talking about how he doesn't get any money from that because it's basically art theft. But we don't have to talk about that right now. And how he's just like, I think he was saying he's like, I still want to draw. Like, I mean, people assume that I don't want to work anymore, but I I want to work. I still want to draw comics. Um, even though I'm old, it's not like, you know, you have a whole retirement plan. It's freelance work for the most part. I mean, if you get lucky, as some people get lucky enough to, like, create a character. And if you get to create characters or books, that's why everybody does indie books now. Because if you do indie books, you make more money on them, even if you don't sell as many issues. And you own those characters. So if somebody's like, oh, I think this could be a movie or a TV show, then... They don't ring up Marvel. They ring you up. Yeah, they got to ring you up. And they yeah. got to get... Send you money. And I saw that Rick Remender was working on a, a new book that came out this week too. Um, yeah, I just picked this up. It's called Death and Glory. It's him in Bengal, who I love Bengal. He is one of the best non Japanese p- people to do like manga style art. Like it feels like any other manga. And it, it's this book about a girl who drives cars and she gets in some trouble it looks like i don't know everything but it looks really cool and i'm going to, to try to i'm gonna read it i'm yeah. gonna read it i'm gonna let you know later what's 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 good what's not good what's you know great about it because i remember i saw i was thinking about this a few days ago i was like what is rick Remend- rick a little bit of that <laughs> what is rick remender doing now, like, after he left Marvel, like, he didn't leave Marvel, Marvel. he just hasn't had a Marvel book since, like, uh, Sam Wilson became Cap. Yeah. Like, right before Secret Wars. Yeah. So I was like, what is he doing? And I guess he's been doing indie books. Yeah. A lot of people, a lot of people stop taking the time off. Yeah, he's doing, he's got, he's got a whole indie label, Giant Generator, and he's doing, um, Black Science. Um, he's been doing that for a while, it's like. And uh, Seven to Eternity, which I think just came out, Fear Agent, and then this book. So a lot of people will do that. Like a lot of people make that decision because it allows them to working at Marvel and stuff allows them to gain a fan base, but then like doing their own books makes people it makes them curious about their own books. And yeah, and you can depending on how good your book is, it can sell for getting reprints, all that cool stuff. So yeah. Yeah. About the two books that we talked about, DC Nation number zero and Avengers number one, which was your favorite? I'm going to say DC Nation number zero. Just yeah. Because it had a few different stories. All of them I'm curious about. Curious about. All of them I'm like, what's going on? What's happening? But I did like Avengers a lot. I'm a huge fan of Jason Aaron, but I feel like it has to get to the biggest story before you like, oh, snap. Before you commit to it. Yeah, well, yeah, yeah, before you just, like, you got to it, yeah. I'm curious about what's going on for sure. I definitely want to come back to the story. I definitely want to know what happened. So, I think both are coming out. I think we're going into a period of time. We might be going into a um, period of time where DC and Marvel are kind of, like, evened out again. Yeah, it's which, definitely heading towards that. It feels yeah, that way. Yeah, because there's, 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 like, three... I feel like there's three phases in comic sales. There's, like, 
Marvel dominates, DC dominates, but then, like, both are kind of about the same. Now, like, sales will still dwindle, but, like, no one can really... No one's going to be like, oh, like, Marvel Marvel books suck right now. Like, everything's bad. Like, they were last... Like, the last two, like... Yeah, last two years. Yeah. You could definitely feel in the air right now. There's definitely going to be a, a, a shift in one way or the other. It's going to be... Because the past two years, it was like, Marvel sucks, DC's doing so great... I think now we're going to have an equilibrium right before Marvel takes over again. Yeah. And that might last, because it always changes. The cycle gets shorter and shorter every time. Because I remember, like, uh, maybe seven, ten years, like, Marvel was on top, and everyone's, like, so on board with Marvel. And then DC, around, like, 2011, they did New 52. And that got a lot of people into DC. And that was kind of starting to, to dwindle the Marvel audience yeah. a little bit. And now we're getting to the... The equilibrium. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Which, honestly, to me, is always a good time. That's usually when all the, like, cool little stuff comes out, and it's just, like, every everybody's doing something cool. A lot of stuff. Because a lot of stuff is shaking up. A lot of people are moving around, doing their own thing, or moving to different companies. Like, um, Jason Aaron is, like, taking a big space in Marvel, and, like... He's and the only one they have left. Yeah. Well, that's what the well. You remember that's what Ben just said. One of the reasons he left was to give you know people like him and um, Kelly Thompson a lot of space. And I think Kelly is going to write a lot of really great books. She's been doing books. All of the her books I usually really like, and I think that she's probably going to be one of those people. One of like the first. I, I wouldn't be surprised if she's like the first woman to write Avengers. Yeah, I could see that. Um, or at least like. A spinoff for right now and then yeah. build her up to something or just put her on an X-Men book well she's on X-Men right now with uh, Rogue and Gambit yeah yeah. she's writing a lot and there's a lot of other people too who yeah the whole like Cullen Guns. Bunn Cullen Bunn is great yeah Matthew Rosenberg yeah wait what books does Rosenberg do Rosenberg well he was you know, a lot of his stuff got cancelled but that's Marvel's model right now is like pitch us a book for six issues and if it sells well we'll give you more than six yeah, that was their thing, and then a lot of people were like, "Oh, look at all these Marvel books getting canceled after six or twelve issues." Yeah, like twelve was a good. That was yeah. like the stretch goal for them, pretty yeah, much. Yeah. But we didn't know that until like recently when they're like, "Oh yeah, these books are getting canceled because they were only supposed to have six. Well, I think that's why DC's been doing with a lot of the like, fringe characters, or, like fringe books and characters and stuff. People they know characters they know don't have like a huge fan base, but enough people like they'll sell books. They've been doing those like short like this is you know, we're doing like the six issue even Man of Steel is only like six issue series or like and that stuff's in continuity, but it's like a few Yeah. It's like okay. But it's over there. Yeah. You don't have to buy it, but if you're a fan you can get it. Yeah. Especially like and you have books like Mr. Miracle and what else is doing this like not and there's, like if there's Ragman, there's Raven. Yeah. Uh Dead Man had a book. So they not they not betting on somebody coming in and doing a book forever unless a book runs happens to run forever, you know what yeah. I mean? So like that that to me makes a lot of sense just because of the way people read comics now, a lot of people get stuff online, a lot of people get trades and stuff, and you can just do two or three trades, you know. And people trades are kind of a better value, honestly. Yeah. At um, least for like resale. Yeah. Especially for resale. Like I think I think that like that trades like they should sell trades at like movie theaters honestly yeah i was thinking that too um that would be really cool i think that would be really good for the market if they was like oh like you can get you can get his trades like jimmy um jimmy palmani did a post this few days ago around the time affinity war came out he was just like really glad the movies are doing well but i wish they would help comic sales a little bit like maybe they could have give out free comics at premieres and stuff when you bought a ticket and i was like yeah it makes sense it's kind of weird that they don't do that yeah. that like if you did one of those like early like you guys did the early screening of infinity war thing and like you got like the coin and like a little thing but like why would why didn't they give you like um it's funny they actually do give digital comics like the the back of some of their stuff has like codes for digital comics so you get like the first trade of, like, Black Panther, you get, like, the first issue of, like, this Avengers yeah. run, or you get, like, something for, oh, your, really? something for your money's worth. But then a lot of people don't take advantage of that. So yeah. why not just have trades or, like, physical copies of something? Yeah. So people it see makes it. makes sense. Yeah, it makes sense. I, I think financially it does make sense to give them out digitally, but, like, unless you at least got to give people, like, a big, 
like like a like a postcard thing that's just like free digital comic like yeah. so you know like don't make it like the thing at the back of the yeah like make pamphlet. it like make it obvious like sell sell that like be like free, it comes with a free comic and like big ass letters you know like really sell it yeah but um, also the digital market's kind of like some people are more into the physical thing oh yeah other people are more into the digital I'm, yeah I'm definitely one of those people like I like physical comics more. I don't like, I was telling, I think I was telling you this. I don't like, and I found out I'm like probably one of the few people who doesn't like it, but I don't like the um, assisted reading thing on um, Comic Sexology. They've been doing it since Comic Sexology started. Marvel did it when they had digital thing and that tech, like they, they would do it with Comic Sexology too. And it was just Are you like, saying Comic Sexology or Comicsology? Comicsology? Yeah. Comics, I keep calling it Exology. I don't know. <laughs> Comicsology. And, um, I don't like it very much. I kind of prefer, like, just them giving me an image and, like, a PDF and, like, me zooming in and out. Which is, like... That's the old way of doing it. That's, like, the old Marvel Unlimited way before they did the, yeah, the guided which, reading. Which is... Yeah, that's... that's how, Actually, no, they've always done the guided reading. Not Marvel, every comic had yeah. guiding reading when it came out, but I'm talking about, was. like, 2006 Marvel yeah. Unlimited. Really? Yeah. Really. I'm always used to, like, me being on my computer screen and being, like... Zoom in a little bit. Yeah, no, they there's the, a guy that read them on the screen. Using the thing, like it used to exist. I used to. Hate, that's when. That's why I started hating it. Cause I was like, I don't like the fact that I can't. Like it was zoom in the parts it wanted to zoom in on, and it was like preset. And so like if they forgot to like leave some room, I'd be like, what that? What's that detail over there? Like it was yeah. weird for me. Cause I can kind of focus on what I think is important and what I want to focus on, like little things, and like go back. So I think you could set it up to where it didn't do that. Or you, it was depending on like what option it started at, but like they usually were like, oh, got it reading. Like they were really excited about it. And I would have like the bubbles would pop up in certain times and little animations sometimes. And I'd be like, I don't need all that. Like yeah. I really don't. I'm just here to read. I don't want to. Oh all man, this. when they try to do motion comics, oh, I hated motion comics. We could do a whole thing about motion comics. <laughs> I, I loved, hated them like in 2008, 2009. Yeah, yeah. I, I never. I got. The only Should we time, save that motion comics rant for later? Do we want to? I guess we can. I guess. I guess we can. We I, can I save think this the, motion is the end of the episode right now. Rant for later, but yeah, um, yeah. I can tell you about the only time I let it slide, and I'm kind of mad now because I found out later that they use the motion comics to change some details about that comic, and I was like, why did they do that? Why Are you talking they? about Black Panther? Yes. Yes. BET Black Panther. That could be the whole centerpiece <laughs> of the conversation. But for this week, that's going to be it for uh, us at Nerd Boys Comic Blog. I'm Marco. All right. I'm Damon. We'll see you guys next week. All right. Peace.